when Mobutu was there, Congo was still plundering, and this country never belonged to Congolese people. Today you are... So if you're not familiar, um, I'm going to try not to pause this every 10 seconds. I think what she's saying is really important. When she talks about the history of Congolese um, colonization, what she's talking about is um, how the Belgian government actually used to essentially own the Congo. Um, I think I spoke about this on one of my last streams, but if you haven't heard of it, it's a book called um, King Leopold's Ghost. And King Leopold was the king of Belgium. And hi, Caesar. Um, so, so King Leopold was the king of Belgium. And in, I think it was the 1800s, the late, late 1800s, um, early, I don't even know. I honestly don't even know if it went into the 1900s. Yeah, okay. So late, you know, mid, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, he had a grip on, Belgium had a grip on the Congo. And they would extract and exploit um, rubber from the Congo because there's a lot of rubber tree. And I didn't know this actually, but um, rubber actually comes from, <laughs> I'm sorry, I think these are like actual rubber plants. Um, yeah. So rubber can be made from plants. So you can see here that it's on the trees like this and people go into the forests. They have workers go into the forests and they collect, uh, they collect the rubber from the plant. And so in the 1800s, uh, Leopold was able to collect and um, farm tons and tons and tons of rubber. Um, so it was rubber and it was also ivory. And they would take the ivory from, from elephants and from animals and that sort of thing. So the problem with this is like, not only is this like a massive um, ecological, ecologically damaging when you don't do this in a responsible way, but I believe that it's also, um, I believe it's like easy to get hurt uh, with, the, with the rubber trees as well. But the way that they ran this colony was, I mean, absolutely brutal. So, again, it's interesting that it's sad that she made the comment about children losing their hands because one of the most infamous aspects of the Belgian rule over the Congo, one of, one of the most infamous aspects of the Belgian rule over the Congo was that um, they would cut off people's hands. So, um <clears throat> It was, uh, I guess, to, to prove, to prove to their uh, overseers, uh, their bosses, um, that they had actually disciplined the workers. They would have to turn in, they had like a number of hands they had to turn in to prove that they had, um, I'm sorry, this is really hard to talk about. It's, it's really, it's really awful. Um, so this is an image. This is a real image. That is a, that's a severed hand. That's a severed foot. Um. It says a father stares at the hand and foot of his five-year-old daughter, severed as a punishment for having harvested too little rubber. So, Leopold amassed a huge amount of personal fortune, exploiting the natural resources of the Congo. At first, it was ivory that was exported, um, but this didn't make them the kind of money they wanted. So, there was a, you know, during the Industrial Revolution, there was this extreme need for rubber. So... Leopold found himself sitting on what was essentially a gold mine at the time. And yeah, here, abuses, especially in the rubber industry, included forced labor of the native population, beatings, widespread killings, and frequent mutilations when product production quotas were not meant. So this person, Jason Harris, or John Harris, I'm sorry, um, was a missionary who threatened to go public at the time with what he had seen. And you're like, well, yeah, he's a missionary, obviously, but <clears throat> Leopold and his organization or, you know, his his uh, network over there, their, the, the officers that they had over there would bribe missionaries at the time. So missionaries would come from all over the world because, I mean, obviously at, at the time this is happening, um, we have... Uh, we have newspapers, we have communication, I believe there's, there's telegraphs, that sort of thing. So, so Europe, there is like communication networks happening right now. So Swedish, um, Swedish 
missionaries were very, that was a very um, big thing. Uh, missionaries would go from Sweden and they would go to the Congo and they would get bribed and they would get paid off. So then they would go back to Europe and all of Europe and a lot of the international world thought that these colonies were actually this like great humanitarian effort because King Leopold, um, he was brilliant actually. In some aspects, uh, Leopold was an extraordinarily brilliant man who's very good at marketing, who's very good at PR. So he spun all of this as this sort of like paternal, racist, um, we're protecting them, we're teaching them, we're providing them with clothes and, and morals and education. And he, he portrayed it as this, um, oh, bye, have a, have a good rest of your day. He portrayed it as this great humanitarian um, effort. And they formed commissions and um, the, he got, he raised a ton of funding actually uh, from other European nations and other monarchs and, and from very rich people at the time to go and to fund the things that were happening in the, convo, in the Congo. Um, and so everyone thought, oh, you know, he's, he's saving these people. He's educating them. He's, he's teaching them. They're, you know, they're bringing salvation and, and, and industry and civilization. And meanwhile, they were literally cutting off the hands of children. And, and uh, whipping was a really huge thing. Whipping was one of the preferred methods of torture. Um, and much like in the Holocaust, where there's all these stories of um, the people being drawn into positions of power, also much like the prison system in the United States today, you hear these stories about people who become COs who are just these like psychotic, violent, um, sadistic people. We, we heard the same thing with, um, with guards in the Holocaust, right? Where, you know, you would have these, um, these people who wanted to be part of this huge, disgusting project because they were sadists. So there was a lot of the same thing happening in the Congo as well, as there were there these overseers and these these men and these European men in positions of power who were like horrifically abusive. Um, so this happened for a very, very long time. <sighs> Estimates of the death toll range from one million to fifteen million. So this person, E.D. Morell, he was a journalist at the time, and he is actually the, the whistleblower who blew this entire story wide open because he was looking at, um, he was looking at the, uh, the ledgers or the records for a shipping company, actually. One of the companies that worked with Belgium and Leopold to ship the materials and he was realizing this stuff isn't adding up. Like for the amount that they're claiming they're shipping and like the money that they're making, um, something is not adding up here, right? So people didn't know that, that slave labor was happening in the Congo. They thought that these people who were doing the farming and doing the harvesting, that they were, that it was fair trade. Um, and it was actually E.D. Morell that found, hold on, the only way these numbers work is if people are not being paid. And it took him a while and he dug through tons of records um, and he realized that the only way that the data made sense was if slave labor was being used. So he went to his bosses, at his higher ups at, at this um, uh, huge magazine or newspaper that he worked for. And his boss was basically just like, stop asking questions. Stop. So E.D. Morell was so upset and so incensed by what he had discovered and the reaction that it caused that he left this newspaper and started his own. So um, he left the, the paper that he worked for, the major publication that he worked for at the time, and I believe he started um, his own paper. I think it was called the African Review. Let's see. E.D. Morell. Oh, I guess this is um, a prime source of education and influence in the field of African history. I didn't, I didn't know that he wrote this book, but um, so, so let's see. Um, Edie Morel, African Review, or it's either the African Review or the African Journal. Okay, that's right. I'm so sorry. I totally got this wrong. Um, I apologize. 
classic lefty misinfo. I'm very sorry. Um, it wasn't that he was a journalist before. I'm so sorry. I totally got this wrong. It was that he actually worked for the shipping company. Okay. That's right. Because I was, I, was, I was wondering, as I was telling you guys, I was like, how did, why was he looking through shipping records? I re misremembered this. So he became a journalist and an author later on. But when he discovered this, he was working for the shipping company itself. That's what it was. That's right. So he was a young official at the shipping company. He was actually up for, uh, I remember now, he was actually up for a huge promotion. Um, and he was like, it, it was expected that he would like climb through the rakes and do really well. Um, so that's right. He was looking through their own records and he realized that there were massive discrepancies in what they were reporting, how much they said they were shipping, like profits, things like that. So then he correctly deduced that these resources were being extracted from the population by force, and he began to campaign to expose the abuses. Um, let's see. So he led a campaign against slavery in the Congo. Um, he founded the Congo Reform Association. And, okay, so he, the, the, the paper that he started was the West African Mail. With the help of celebrities such as Arthur Conan Doyle and Mark Twain, the movement successfully pressured the Belgian King Leopold to sell the Congo Free State to the Belgian government, ending some of the human rights abuses perpetrated under his rule. So he was also a British pacifist during the First World War. As part of his campaign against the French, he became the most important English proponent of the Black Shame Campaign, which accused black French troops of outrages against the... Ooh. So, a mixed bag. Um... It's, it's really interesting. Um, you, you like read about people from this time period and you're like, wow, they did this incredible thing. And then you read other things that they did for that time period. And you're like, oh God, they did an awful thing. Um, if I recall correctly, he was also like a strong proponent of, um, British power over other nations. So we're not going to dig too deep into that because we're going to find a lot of other gross stuff. The point was about the Congo. The point was about the Congo. So. When this activist, this woman, when she talks about the history of colonization in the Congo, that's what she talks about. She talks about these like horrific human rights abuses, um, entire villages being cleared out of people. I mean, you, you heard what I said. They're, they're talking about like deaths anywhere on the scale of one to 11 million people. Entire villages is being slaughtered, you know? Um, in the book, it, it, it talks a lot about, um, how villagers would actually, when they would hear, that the Belgian officers were coming in the direction of where they lived, that they would burn their own villages and run into the forests. I mean, they, was, they were considered like the Great White Terror, you know? It was um, like just really absolutely horrific uh, human rights abuses. So the Congo has a very, very long history of um, being a colonized country.